Medium. <laughs> okay, we are live. How's it going, Emma? Good, how are you? I am well. Hi, everybody. Welcome to episode number nine of... Nine, yes, nine, of the Messy Desk Concert and Conversation Series. And uh, I'm very excited to have with me today my illustrious guest, Emma Rush. Hello, Emma. Hi, it's the first time anybody's ever called me illustrious. Well, there's plenty of firsts here, I assure you. All right, I'm stoked. Um, so just before you play for everybody at the beginning, do you want to tell people just a brief summary of yourself? Not your whole life story, we'll get to that, but just like... You know. <laughs> Um, well, I uh, play guitar and I live in Hamilton in Canada. Um, I uh, play lots of chamber music with Sara Traficante, a flutist. I run the Guitar Hamilton concert series and three-day summer festival also here in Hamilton. And um, that's it. I do all the normal stuff. Nice. Teach, play. I didn't realize all those things were normal. Um. um but that's awesome. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> cool. Um, okay, so before you play here, I'm just going to give the usual disclaimers. Everyone who's watching, please smash that like and share button, especially the share one. To get yeah, yeah, do it. I just did it. Nice. I'm setting a good example. I have shared it, and so should you. You're such a good example, Emma. Um, and, yeah, and there's also a link to donate. And if you donate during the stream, some of it will go to the artist. So please give that a look. And what are you going to play, Emma, to start us off with today? Okay, well, in light of the current world situation, I thought I would play something uh, really depressing. Oh, nice. So I'm going to play a piece that I recently learned. And um, it's by the Welsh composer Hilary Tan. And it's called A Sad Pavan Forbidding Morning. Ooh. And this piece... Um, it's sort of like a fantasy on an earlier work. Um, so the British composer Thomas Tompkins wrote a piece called A Sad Pavan for These Distracted Times in 1649, which was like a pretty chaotic time um, in England. And um, so he wrote this really heavy um, pavan. And um, so this piece, it sort of um, borrows little bits from it here and there, and then it uh, a couple of different points actually just like quotes from that piece cool yeah so not like the uh, smartphone distractions those were not the distracted huh? times it wasn't smartphone distractions that they had then <laughs> no i don't think so although i feel like that's like definitely a huge distraction in my life <laughs> yeah for sure especially when you're stuck in indoors all the time um russ callison has a right like and subscribe like and subscribe you're correct russ um, okay, let's hear you play some music, Emma. Oh, hi, Russ. Okay, should I start? Yes, go ahead. Okay, sorry, I don't really know, like, how this works. It's okay, you My, just... My just... first live stream event. Nice. Thank you. 
Beautiful. Very nice. <laughs> awesome. Was she a guitarist? No. Okay. Yeah, because there's some there's some pretty big stretches in there. Yeah. 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 It's cool. I, the, there's some. Is there like some octatonic passages in there? It sounded like to me. Is there what? Some octatonic passages in there. Some of the bass lines were pretty uh, spicy. What does that mean? Like the, using the octatonic scale. Oh, I have no idea. Oh, okay, it's fine. No worries. Cool. That's great. It's a nice piece. Yeah, I think it's really cool. And I think that's the, like, um, Hilary Tan has written loads and loads of stuff, but I think that's her only guitar piece. Cool. And I can only find that um, one person has recorded it in a whole volume of, um, like, only Welsh music. Oh, cool. It, yeah. it kind of reminds me of that, like, Alan Rossthorn piece, you know, the elegy? No, I don't know any guitar repertoire. As uh, as we're going to get to that in the repertoire guessing game. Um, <laughs> Amy says she liked and subscribed in all seven dimensions. Thank you, Amy Brandon. Oh, great. Hi, Amy. Very helpful. Um, and for everybody watching, if you have questions, please tell us. Yeah. Because we how would do like... I see the, How do I see these comments? You just have to click on the video, and then the comments should pop up. Pop up. Okay. Oh, yeah, there's me laughing. Yeah, you might want to turn the audio off. <laughs> yeah, I'm doing it. Okay. Um... Emma Rush is watching. It's telling me Emma Rush is watching. Amazing. Um, cool. Great. Awesome, Emma. Uh, so you told us a little bit about yourself, but how about your life story? Maybe like the abbreviated version. Just give us like a little more background on you. Um, okay. Well, I'm uh, from Hamilton, which is where I now live. And um, I did not play guitar for most of my, well, all of my early life. Ah, oh, you're like I, me, you started late. <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah, I started when I was 19, I think. Okay, same to me. So was, oh my gosh. Well, one of many things we have in common. Yes, exactly. Um, but so I played like lots of instruments when I was younger, um, like through various like, school programs and my um, parents like dutifully put me in piano lessons, etc. Um, and it was like a great time when you still could learn a lot of instruments in school, um, which is like becoming more and more of a problem, at least in North America, I think. Yeah, I don't know how it is here, but I'm guessing not that much better. Yeah. Um, and then I really didn't like play much of anything at all in high school because I was like thoroughly distracted with lots of other stuff. And then afterwards, I was in like a kind of um, uh, aimless zone in my life like not knowing what to do and then i had a couple of friends who were studying classical guitar at mohawk college here in hamilton um where actually i teach now and i like heard them playing and i was so into it like i just totally fell in love with classical guitar and that's like kind of how that started awesome and then and, so you did your undergrad here or in canada i mean not here yeah i did my undergrad um in halifax at okay. dalhousie City, and then after that, I went to um, Germany and I studied with Dale Kavanaugh. Cool. Yes, that's right. Awesome. And then you came back to Hamilton and started one of the greatest festivals in Canada, I think. <laughs> um, yeah, I kind of just like, like I was never going to leave Europe. I loved it. I, and I mean, I still do. Um, but it's sort of a spur of the moment decision. I was like, I should just go to Canada and see what it's like and see if I can like, get something going. And so it was like two weeks after I had that thought, I'd like gotten rid of my apartment in Germany and all my stuff and was like in Hamilton, like what is going on? Like, what have I just done? I can't imagine. <laughs> I, yeah. Yeah. I can't imagine leaving Europe right now, to be honest. Yeah. Like, so it was like crazy. It was such a big like culture shock. It is like life shock of like making this decision so quickly. Yeah. And then I wound up, um, I lived in BC for almost a year when I oh, yeah. got back. You were in Vancouver, right? Yeah. Cool. I forgot yeah. about that. Yeah. Like, I kind of, I showed up in Hamilton, I was like, here for a couple of months, and I went to Toronto for a couple of months, and I came back here for a month, then I went, like, to BC for a while. Right, okay. And then in the end, I was like, okay, I'm just gonna, like, I was having a hard time finding work in Vancouver. It's hard there. Work. Yeah. Yeah, and I had, I had some of just, like, like, the most awful teaching gigs <laughs> of my life there like I had to do this um 
a group class, like for the Van School Board, but it was like really early on a Saturday morning, which is not my sort of natural time to shine. I used to have one and of it these. Was, it was like 20 kids and they were aged 7 to 15. Yeah. I had something like this in Calgary when I was there where I was doing like an after school group class. So like yeah. you would think that was good because they're like done school so they're happy, but no, they're like grumpy and want to go home. But it's like the group class for parents who want their kids to stay for another hour at school so they can get more stuff done. So and it was yeah. like you said, it was like this age range of like six or seven years. And so you're like you can't do anything because they're all at a different level and it, yeah, it was just a disaster. Yeah, yeah, it was really hard. So yeah, so eventually I just I was like, I'm just gonna go to Hamilton and hang out there until I figure out where to go. And now I'm still here. Yeah, but you I mean you made something amazing happen there, I think. Like, yeah. Well, it was a, um, like, the, it was just kind of wide open, you know? Like, yeah. there was nothing going on at all for guitar when I got here, which was, um, like, depressing, but also... Um, An opportunity. Uh, I prefer tragedy to quote Homer Simpson. <laughs> what is that? Wait, wait, one more time. What? Huh? What, what was the word again? Tragedy. Tragedy. Hmm. <laughs> yeah. That's a good way of putting it. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and it's also like Hamilton had this kind of like super depressed downtown for like many, many years. Like a lot of these like Rust Belt cities in North America, like um, like the industry kind of slowed down and whatever else happens to a city, like you build malls on the outskirts. And um, so it was, Hamilton was kind of going through this like arts renaissance, you know, where like people were going back to downtown and everyone was getting excited about Hamilton again. And there are all these sort of different um, like arts projects springing up. And so it was kind of great timing for Guitar Hamilton to appear. Yeah, good. Um, sorry, I just stopped my video um, okay. because my webcam is doing weird things in OBS. So you won't be able to see me, but everybody else can. Okay. <laughs> sorry, I was listening. Um, yeah, I mean, yeah, I, it, I mean, job prospects are not amazing as guitarists, you know, unless unless you can be entrepreneurial and make something yourself, right? Like, and I think that's, I, I feel like I preach about this every episode of this show, but like, yeah, I think, you know, the, those, the guitarists who have longevity are the ones who can do something grassroots kind of, I think, you know, to some degree. I mean, there are other paths too, of course, but yeah, I think seeing like a gap to fill and then filling it is kind of like a good strategy you know yeah yeah absolutely yeah and like there's loads of them all over the place you yeah. know like um ways to figure out like programming that's going to suit you and your community yeah exactly um yes russ obs for the win obs is great i love how often i have trouble with it um <laughs> <laughs> uh tragedy a word for the ages yep exactly um yeah cool Awesome. Yeah, and I think we met in Calgary, but you had already started Guitar Hamilton by that point, right? I think so, yeah. Yeah. Cool. Oh, I'm just going to say hi to David Stott, who said hi on the comments. Hi, David. Hi, David. <laughs> uh, I don't know David, but hi anyways. Uh, cool. Okay. Well, good life story, Emma. 10 out of 10. Okay, thank you. Wow, that's great. Uh, next question is the, like, gotcha question of the stream. How do you define classical guitar? Oh, I don't know. I don't. You don't? Okay, that's, that's a good answer. <laughs> so if you tell someone you're a classical guitarist and they're like, what's that? You just say, I don't know. No, I mean, what I normally say is that it's, um, that it just has a really wide umbrella, you know, of things that fall into the classical guitar category, you know, because yep. we have so much huge, um, so many huge bodies of repertoire open to us, you know, like, all of the Spanish music, all the Latin American music, there's so much early music, modern music, there's just so many different things. I feel like it's quite difficult to say like this is classical guitar. Yeah. Yeah, and it, um, yeah, sorry, go ahead. Yeah, and then also like there's so many, I don't know, I feel like I do lots of things that kind of fall outside of that even, you know, like I have um, like this record of tunes that are not super classical, <laughs> like, you know, mm -hmm. cover tunes, or I have like, you know, a project where I play with like an acoustic guitarist, like, yeah, I don't know. I'm not sure how to define it. Yeah, it's not, um, well, it, I mean, the first problem is what you're saying. It's hard to define because we have a lot of different 
kind of directions we can go and blend things a little bit. But beyond that, I think it's also difficult because the words themselves don't communicate what people think they would to them. Like for the average person who hears classical guitar, they're probably thinking like Mozart, Beethoven and stuff. And while we do have like our 19th century composers, I would say the vast majority of the rep that most people play is not anything close to that actually. So like, it's also a problem of communication because if you say classical violin, or if you just say violin, people kind of, there's an association in the public eye with the repertoire, but not with the classical guitar, you know? Yeah. I don't know. So it's, it's a problematic descriptor, I think, but yeah. Yeah. Well, anyways, I mean, I just think it just doesn't really need defining, right? Like just play music. Right. Yeah. You can't define me, man. <laughs> <laughs> awesome. Uh, cool. And what is your favorite cocktail right now or drink to make during the quarantine? Oh, um, well, I really enjoy drinking gin. Mm -hmm. so I've been drinking a lot of Negronis. Oh, yeah, you are, told me this. Uh, yeah. Yeah. So, uh, gin, Campari, vermouth, and like a twist of orange peel. Mm. Sounds so delicious. So, that's one of those like only alcohol cocktails. Yeah, the best kind. Uh, it really gets the job done. Yeah. Sounds tasty. Yeah, we've been making old fashions, which also have a bit of orange. Oh, yeah. It's, it's always a nice touch, I feel like. Yeah. Orange. Oranges are great. I like oranges. Yeah. Cool. Uh, David Stott says, Canadiana is a great city from Emma. True story. Um, oh, people are asking questions. Oh, my goodness. Uh, Elios Yuen says, what's your favorite period of music to play in, Emma? Oh, um, I don't have one. I like them all. <laughs> wow. How egalitarian of you. <laughs> Well, I mean, it, it's true. Like, I, I mean, I wind up, I think, in my concert programming, it's mostly um, 20th century music. Okay. Uh, not the particularly, like, uh, edgy kinds of that, but... Not like <laughs> the stuff. first piece you played? Huh? Not like the first piece you played? Yeah. Um, although I'm really into that piece. I really like it. It's cool. Um, but then, you know, I hang out with my friend and colleague, um, Jesse Luciani, like, every couple of weeks. Uh, and we just like jam renaissance tunes together and cool. then like in my um duo azeline duo sarah and i play mostly spanish and south american rap so it's like it's all over the place yeah cool um i was gonna say oh yeah i was gonna say actually i thought about this when you were playing the piece i think like that kind of sort of the texture of that piece like the sort of modern texture actually goes quite well with renaissance music so i think those kind of quotations in a piece like that really work you know yeah. It's really cool. Um, they kind of flow seamlessly into each other. Neat. Um, Louis Trepanier says, classical guitar. We work at playing lines without letting the legato fall by the wayside because it's guitar playing. Trying to play our line more like vocal lines, so it's an approach. Huh. Interesting. So for Louis, it's about the musical approach, I guess. I would say that's probably accurate, although that's not a description you can give to someone on the street there. They're going to understand, <laughs> unfortunately. Um, oh, more questions. Uh, Amy Brandon says, what inspired you to start Azaline Duo? That's with Sarah. It's flute and guitar, right? Yeah. Yes. Um, well, basically, like, um, Sarah got in touch with me to see if I wanted to, like, have a coffee and, um, like, maybe talk about playing some music together. And I thought it was a great idea, like, first of all, because she's awesome. Um, but also, um, because I had really like, I had played such a small amount of chamber music before that. So it was, um, like seemed like just such a great idea for me personally, like just to, um, improve as a musician and like, uh, sort of open myself up to some different stuff. And then also, um, it really opens up where you can play. True. You know, like. Um, so it gives you so many more opportunities and like, I love playing concerts and play loads of them. And it's, um, you know, it, it's, I think there's just a lot more doors open when you've got more than a, just a solo guitar project. Yeah. And also a lot of successful performers who have a lot of concerts have a lot of different ensembles and that's partly why they have a lot of concerts. <laughs> right. Sorry, can you say that again? A lot of like very successful concert artists who have a lot of concerts have quite a few ensembles and that's why they have that number of concerts. Yeah. Right. Like, yeah. It's exactly what you said. It's just, yeah. It's hard to sell the guitar by itself, but it's a little bit sell easier to sell a unique like combination of things. 
Well, Zara and I also, like, our program, although it's, like, uh, I think, like, very quality, um, it also has a sort of good appeal um, to people that are not into classical music. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so that means it also is, like, quite appealing for presenters, right? If we yep. are saying, like, oh, we've got all this, you know, all these, like, hot Spanish licks, <laughs> then, yep. um, you know, that, like, sort of really gets people in the door. So it, it's you know, it's commercially sort of appealing as well. For sure. Yeah. I mean, you have to think about that with all the different groups you do and you don't, you don't kind of want to like, I don't know, you don't want to specialize completely in with both solo and not chamber playing to be playing the same kind of music. I mean, you have to, you know, yeah, yeah, for sure. Cool. Well, let's move on to one of our favorite segments on this show. Are you ready, Emma? Here is the part of the show where normally we would play the repertoire guessing game, where I embarrass the guest by playing clips from guitar recordings and having them guess the piece, composer, and player, and we talk about the music. Unfortunately, YouTube and or Naxos, the label where many of the recordings come from, automatically block my videos when I do this due to copyright claims. Even though I know that short clips of copyrighted content are allowed under fair use when they are being used for commentary and or education. Due to this delightful roadblock from our benevolent YouTube overlords, we'll be skipping this section, but if you'd like, you can check out the full stream of the Repertoire Guessing Game on Facebook through the link below in the description box. Now, back to our fascinating guest. Um, you have 8 out of 9 in the first category, uh, 7 out of 9 in the second. This is unbelievable. And three out of nine in the last. All right. So in total, it's 18 out of 27. Exactly the maximum score I thought I could get. Exactly. You oh, reached your well, goal. That's good. You know what? I actually have been studying for this. Like, I oh. have been um, on Skype with Jesse Luciani, and like, he's been feeding me all kinds of guitar tunes. Really? <laughs> That's, they are. that's amazing that's great i'm so happy to hear you <laughs> practice well it paid off because you did better than most people actually yeah it works really hard i yeah. even tried to listen to frank martin but i still can't retain those pieces yeah those are weird ones i thought for sure you would play them i don't know if you remember like last time you were in hamilton i was like no matter how many times i listened to those pieces i just yeah. can't like remember them i remember you wanted a diatribe against them I think it wasn't a diatribe against them. I think they're good every time I hear them, but then just the next time I hear them, I'm like, oh, what are these? <laughs> right, yeah, that's fair. It's funny because yeah. a lot of people you know play them, like Steve and and Nathan. <laughs> it's funny. I know. Yeah. Um, nice. Well, that would have been better than the, the, the one I played in the end. <laughs> the Martin. <laughs> <laughs> Anyhow, okay, let's move on. So, uh, that was, I'm so glad that's over. I feel like that was like so intense, and now I'm much more relaxed. You did great. You were excellent. You're probably more intense than having to play, right? Yeah, maybe. Because now that you're relaxed, you should play for us again. Okay. Um. Okay. What are you gonna play? Um. I'm gonna play a piece by the Dutch composer Annette Kruisbrink, uh, who, if anybody who's like watching doesn't know her or her music, you should check it out. She's like an extremely prolific composer and um, just writes like incredible music for solo guitar and then like loads and loads of chamber music, guitar ensemble, like everything you could want. She's got something in her catalog for you. Mm -hmm. Um, and she's like, I, um, like I've kind of admired her from afar for many, many years. And then I was able to actually meet her in Nordhorn last year. And I'd had this like idea for so long that she was going to be this like completely like kick-ass woman. And I was like, totally right. Awesome. <laughs> so, nice. Uh, yeah. So it was really, um, great to meet her. And, uh, anyways, so this piece is homage to Paco de Lucia. Cool. And for people who want to look her up, it's spelled Krausbrink, so K-R-U-I-S and then Brink, B-R-I-N-K, if you want to look up her music. Yeah, and I probably pronounced it wrong. Yeah, I was going to say, now that I speak Dutch, you have to say Au for the U-I, Krausbrink. 
Well, I did like a really intensive tutorial with Aneta about how to pronounce her last name and I tried so hard, but I feel like it was one of those things where like she would say it and I would say it and think I was saying exactly what she said and she'd be like, no, 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 voice break. Like, voice break, I'm saying it. And it's like... <laughs> it's fine. I'm sure she doesn't mind. Um, <laughs> and Kevin says, I have no choice but to listen. Emma makes me judge every year. <laughs> <laughs> Poor Kevin having to listen to all the finalists. <laughs> okay, I'm gonna turn off my video here and let you play this pe this tune. Sorry, I can't like tune the guitar even with the tuner, so this might take a while.
Very <laughs> nice. Awesome. The cool piece, right? Yeah, super cool. Yeah. Nice. Amazing. Some really cool arpeggios in there. Yeah. Yeah. Awesome. Yeah, it was so funny when I like got the piece. You know, the tremolo section is in five, right? Like, mm. like five instead of four. And I was just like, the fuck? Why didn't I always practice all the different kinds of tremolo like every technique book tells you to? <laughs> yeah, but I mean, like, <laughs> other, other than in flamenco music, we don't really get that tremolo very often, so. Yeah, well, that's the thing. there it is. You never know when it's going to, like, pop up and surprise you. Exactly. Popping up and surprising. Amazing. That was great. Cool. Um, what do you do to practice, Emma? What are your practicing tips and tricks and secrets? Um, like one of the biggest things I've thought of yesterday, or I thought of recently, I mentioned to you yesterday, which is that you should not try and practice while watching Michael Ibsen's Messy Guest concerts. Because <laughs> you can just sit there holding your guitar and getting nothing done. Because we're because um, I'm too entertaining, right? It totally. I think actually you're doing like a great series here. I think it's really entertaining. Thanks. Emma. I've watched all of them. And actually, like while we're on the topic, like is anybody sending you any money? Well, there have been a, like a couple donations during one stream. <laughs> yeah. So like whoever is watching, like I imagine lots of people that watch this are people that are in the same boat as us. So like maybe do not have like any concerts right now or whatever, but. Even if you don't have any money yourself, you can still like share these or like tell people that do have money to send some in. <laughs> you know, because oh, like that's very sweet. I feel like Mike is doing some like really awesome stuff here, taking a lot of time to bring us like really interesting and entertaining guitar content at this time, and we should you know support that. Thanks, Emma. So, Lots of people still do have money, you know, there's people that can like work from home or they're still like getting their full paycheck and like they can't spend it anywhere else. Like the pub is closed and like what, I don't know what else you do with your money, but. <laughs> <laughs> Fair enough. Yeah. But, but... Know, so send some money to Mike or like share his events and so other people will see it and they can send some money to Mike. That's very sweet. There, yeah, there's a donation link and if you, if, you, if you donate during the stream, some of it goes to the artist too. So that's part of the, the trying to share the love here. Um, and I, I appreciate the kind words. I think this kind of stream, I, yeah, I wanted to create something that's a little more casual, but also just give a people a platform to just be like themselves and interact with anyone who wants to hear them, you know, cause I have the feeling that like sometimes we take guitar, classical guitar too seriously, you know? Uh, yeah. I think that's like, that's true across like all of the classical music world actually. Like, yeah. It's not try and do like in my own career as much as possible is to like play in more low-key situations and like just like have a more relaxed and fun time exactly yeah i mean music is fun right so mm -hmm. yeah i mean it could be yeah but i would not recommend practicing while you watch this that's for sure no no it doesn't work at all like 100 percent i tell you it's impossible you've tried um nice cool so, but that's kind of a good idea for like sort of in general with any practicing is like make sure you're actually practicing, you know. Mm -hmm. um, yep. It's so easy to get like completely distracted. So it's better to like um, turn off all your electronic devices for the duration of the practicing. For sure. Yeah. Or like airplane mode or whatever if you got to use a metronome or something. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, that's true. I mean, some people do try to watch something while they practice, but it's not that effective. I don't think so. Yeah, and I kind of feel like less practice, but more focused practice is better. So. Always. Yeah. Always, always, always. Like, I'd rather have a more balanced life and just practice really efficiently than, like, yeah. you know. Yeah. I mean, I think we still get things done, even if we're not, like, able to concentrate, like, 100% every practice session. You know, like, it's yeah. still still working but like whenever we can be like super super focused i mean that is the that is the best that's the goal for sure yeah, yeah. definitely awesome um do you do like uh, many specific things for like technique or working on specific types of music or is it just like dependent on the program and stuff i guess it's like i have just like sort of technique stuff that i do kind of every day as like part of you know kind of warming up and like staying fit, you know, mm -hmm. um, 
But yeah, then it's sort of, you know, specific focus will change based on like what the repertoire is. And it depends. Like, you know, sometimes if I have like, I don't know, so if I'm doing like loads of chamber music, I'm going to be practicing different things. And if it's loads of my own solo stuff or, um, yeah. Yeah. Jacob Johnson says, is it wrong if I'm practicing while watching this? Yes, Jacob, you should feel very bad. Yeah, it's wrong. Yeah. So much wrong yeah. with that. That's that's part of being a classical musician, too, is telling other people what's wrong and right, right? <laughs> <laughs> but, um, you know, you should still keep watching this. Yeah, exactly. Just don't practice. <laughs> it's fine. This is the whole message of my show. Don't practice. Just stay on the stream. Yeah. <laughs> Well, my next question, Emma, is how you stay sane as a guitarist, as a classical guitarist. What do you do to stay more or less even keel in the middle of having such a kind of crazy profession? Or do you find it fairly calm, actually? Um, no, that's a good question. Like, I think um, something that, I, that just, like, works for me is that I do have a lot of different things going on that sort of um, work for different parts of my personality so you know I, I have like surprisingly to me but some part of me that really likes like doing really organized things so I have like the sort of arts administration stuff I do I really like teaching so I do a bit of teaching I like performing so I do that and like I think I'm also I can never decide if I'm like introverted or extroverted so I think I'm also like because of like this um you know lifestyle I can spend like many weeks alone working on stuff or i can like go out on the road and tour a lot and like both of those things sort of work for me good that's so, good so you're pretty I like, like, I feel like a, a balance that kind of that works and i'm also like i'm just super fortunate that i you know i i just have time to do whatever i want <laughs> all the time yeah know? yeah well you've also like, built a lot of different projects that allow you to be have your hand in many different things you know as a musician which I know some people don't like that. Like there's probably the kind of people who would want kind of like the orchestral musician job where you just like go to your one job, practice that rep, you know, it's predictable. Well, not predictable. Yeah. I don't mean that in like a, but just that it's, it's structured, you know, but for some people, and I kind of like the project thing too, like going from one thing to another. Um, yeah. Yeah. That's the other fun thing about playing like a different program between solo and chamber music, you know, variety. Yeah. Yeah, but sometimes it can be a lot to balance too. So I don't know if you have any tips. It, could, like, it just depends on what you're, what you're like. You know, like if you're extremely, um, like if you need to have a routine, then like my life would not be a good one. Yeah. <laughs> For you. You know, yeah. But... Maybe then you would be more focused on one type of thing, like teaching or playing certain kind of gigs or whatever. Yeah. 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 yeah that's kind of the thing for me too. I like that. Part of my day is playing the guitar. Part of it is teaching lessons now online, but still part of it is doing the stream. Part of it is editing my videos. Part of it is, you know. Yeah. Like there's, I think it's just like, there's so much available to us to do that is still like within our field that yeah. we can really be interested in so many different things. And yeah. You know, the only thing that I'm not a big fan of is the fact that like, sometimes you have to do like 20 things in one day and you only have time for like eight you know so yeah but then like on other days like you have to do one thing yeah it's true yeah very true it's like kind of balances it yeah um kevin mandeville says thinking about alan iverson we're talking about practice not a game not a game we're talking about practice i don't know who this alan iverson person is but yeah, sounds like a smart guy <laughs> um <laughs> nice oh and tim Beatty says practicing is overrated yeah tim knows what's up yeah. That's how he won the Hamilton competition, right? I, I wouldn't know. Did he win? I wasn't listening. <laughs> I forgot. You missed the finals here. <laughs> Sorry, Tim. No one remembers that you won. About this, like, about having sort of like a diverse career. There's a great podcast that is called Crushing Classical. And it's a uh, uh, woman that runs it. It's called Tracy Freelander. And she basically interviews a different person each time, like each episode, that has sort of carved out a really interesting and untraditional career for themselves in the classical music world. And it's really interesting. She cool. gets great, great guests. And it's like, it's really fascinating. I've really learned a lot from it. That's awesome. Yeah, I think that a lot of people, especially in like doing their degrees in music or kind of in the student stage, they don't necessarily realize 
the whole skill set that goes into having a lot longevity and success in your career, you know, like, I don't, I'm not saying that I'm an expert, but just from what I've observed, it seems like the skill set is quite diverse, actually, and mm -hmm. goes far beyond. And in fact, often, some other things are more important than your ability on the instrument, even though that still is important. But no, it's, I think it's really true. Like, yeah. I, it's, I see, I'm sure we've talked about this before. But you know, I see all the time, like really incredible guitarists that are like, at home playing guitar in their basement. And, you know, that they, with a different kind of skill set or a different, like, motivation, different, you know, um, they could be out playing for people, you know. Or just spending a little less time with the guitar and a little more time, like, being a communicative yeah, human like, being. I feel like so much of it is just up to you, right? Like, doing your networking and, like, getting, like, put it, like, deciding on what your product is and then putting it out in the world and getting people to pay attention to it is, yeah. is or finding local places to get involved with and local initiatives to start up, you know? Yeah, absolutely. Um, and also, I mean, the thing for me is like, it's just kind of our, our genre, especially within classical music, but classical music as a whole, but it, even within that, we're like a niche within a niche. Our niche within that niche is not, we don't have an establishment to like support us in terms of like, we don't kind of have people going to the radio for classical guitar or like, the, we're not being like pumped out by any institutions, you know, really. Yeah, but that's true. But like, also though, this, I don't know if there's any other instrument that has like a whole worldwide network of like societies that like no, just but that instrument. This is know? what I mean: is those societies all came out of like grassroots things. Like people were like, "There's nothing in this town. I'm gonna make it." Right. Yeah. And so my point is that like, as a guitarist, if you're not doing something like that to make something. It's kind of like, how do you expect, first of all, how do you expect the art form to survive? But secondly, if you don't have something like that to offer, how do you expect to have like total longevity also? I mean, I know it can be done without like starting your own society, of course, but like, I just mean, it, it just seems like it's a natural part of being a classical guitarist is doing something like starting something, you know? Yeah, a lot of people do it, but like just the flip side of that in a way is um, like, I think it's so valuable actually to look beyond this like. I mean, it's, it's wonderful that we have like such a close knit, like kind of really international guitar community. But I feel like it's really good to look beyond that also. You yeah, know, like, no, no, for sure. Your options, who you can play for, what kind of gigs you get. Right. How much money you make. But I mean, that's part of starting something, too, is that you're trying to show your community what you're doing and they have no mm -hmm. idea. Right. Like there's a lot of classical guitars, I feel like, who live in a town or a city with nothing happening and they don't like. They're not going to people in their city who are not guitarists and being like, hey, this is what I do. Let's make something happen. I don't know. No. Yeah, yeah it's really interesting. Like, cause I do a lot of touring, um, like, particularly within Canada. Um, and, like, Sarah and I do this together a lot. Like, we go to quite, like, remote and rural places and play concerts. And, like, sometimes it's for an audience that has, like, never, ever heard live classical music before. That has, like, certainly not heard classical guitar before. So it's, like... Um, quite interesting to see like how appealing it actually is to people that don't know about it yeah for sure yeah. very i think <laughs> i mean it helps that we're a guitar you know totally. absolutely yeah people know what a guitar is but then you're doing yeah and you do things on it that they've never seen before so yeah 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 cool uh david stott says tell us about your guitar can you tell us about your guitar i i played this guitar last time i was there it's very nice yeah it's um it is by Roland Scharbatka, who is a guitarist, or sorry, a luthier based in Iserlohn in Germany. And it's just like um, kind of a traditional guitar with some like Scharbatka modifications inside, and it's cedar. Nice. <laughs> is it kind of a, is it a lattice bracing? No. No. Okay. Band bracing with some like some other extra stuff inside cross braces or something i don't um, know i don't know anything about guitars this is always like the worst question <laughs> nice well i didn't ask you it. it was someone in the audience so. well i had to do like i did an interview with um classical guitar magazine a couple of years ago like when it still existed and uh the guy was like so like tell me about your guitar and i was just like uh <laughs> deer in the headlights <laughs> <laughs> nice like, I had cedar, and, like, that was it. And 
free call like Roland and be like, okay, <laughs> tell me what's going on here. Yeah, explain this instrument to me. I mean, you know how to play it. That's the important thing. Yeah, I don't know. I just somehow have never been like super into like gear. So even like the actual instrument, like I really like yeah. it. How it looks and, like how it sounds like how it feels, but like the actual information about it just like only enters my head very fleetingly. Yeah, I'm more interested in what I can do on it in the moment and that I like don't really care how that happens in terms of yeah. like the construction. Well, I don't know. No, I, yeah, I don't know. But yeah. Okay, Emma. Well, um, do you want to play some more music for us? You're going to play some Merlin, right? Yeah, yeah. Okay, so I'll play um, one more tune and then I can um, have your, open the door I have, right? Yes, have, your, have a drink with me. Yeah. Um, and then we so can get to the real the real uh deep deep conversation yeah yeah perfect i'll chug it <laughs> perfect <laughs> so you uh, well, this is from the sweets del ricardo, del ricardo. yes ricardo. cool so this is the Haropo. Mm -hmm. it's the last movement of the sweet del ricardo by jose luis merlin mm -hmm. and it's a piece i've been playing for a long time so i shouldn't tune and talk this is all this is a tip don't tune your guitar while you're trying to talk to an audience. Just talk to them because yeah. it's rude talking to your guitar like a jerk. <laughs> like every guitarist ever. <laughs> well, yes. <laughs> but not me at this moment. Yes. Um, so yeah, this is, I, I played the suites for a long time. I really, it was one of like the first pieces I like super fell in love with from the guitar repertoire. Um, and I heard it, I guess, on Jason Hughes' album. It's like GFA album. Oh yeah, that's right. It's on there one yeah and um anyway so it is a whole suite but i'm just gonna play the last movement which is horrible uh which is the kind of uh venezuelan dance and this is on your first cd right yes which is folklorica yes which everyone should check out or do you do you have it on for sale online or something um i ran out of like actual physical copies of it but like it's around like however else you get it spotify or something <laughs> yeah it's on okay. itunes Amazon and all yeah, that yeah. stuff. And you have a, yeah, okay, so there's a nice recording of it by you online. Okay. Let's hear some Merlin. Okay. Should I mute you? How do I do that? My...
Wonderful. So uh, extroverted and joyous. Yeah. Awesome. Well, cheers to that, Emma. Cheers, Mike. Cheers to your excellent performance. Okay. Nice work. Awesome. That was excellent. I like that piece too. It's cool. It must be effective for concerts. It's what? It must be effective for concerts. Oh yeah, for sure. Yeah. Like it's, um, yeah, people love it. Yeah, awesome. Um, what kind of projects do you have on the go right now? I know you were preparing a new CD, right? Yeah, the new CD is recorded, but needs to be um, edited. So I need to write the notes and do the cover and all that stuff. Um, okay. So that's new solo CD. I just released a new duo CD with Sara um, called Fandango. Fandango. Uh, yeah, yeah. So it's got, I think it has a really cool program. It's got um, our own arrangement of the Santiago de Murcia Fandango, um, which was originally for Baroque guitar, but um, like, oh yeah, this probably needs some jazz flute. Um, <laughs> yeah, why not? <laughs> And then we did a couple arrangements of Chiquina Gonzaga tunes because we think she is um, just like such a badass and we love her music. We did those Miroslav Tadic Macedonian pieces um, with alto flute. We did Gerald Garcia's five Celtic pieces with um, Tara did three of the tunes on a Celtic, like a wooden Celtic flute and two of them on tin whistle. Cool. All, and then, oh, and then we did like a brand new piece that Jeff McFadden wrote called the Guardiente. Oh, um, cool. Yeah. So anyway, so that just like entered the world in at the end of February. Nice. And yeah, and then I've got um, sort of a cool new thing coming up. Like, assuming I get the funding, but I will. Um, I'm like sort of uh, related to this Canadian painter William Blair Bruce, who was originally from Hamilton. Um, and I'm commissioning like eight new pieces by Canadian composers that are um, inspired by like the life and works of William Blair Bruce. Awesome. And then that uh, recording project as well as like a, a live sort of presentation of that as well. Can you uh, reveal who the composers are? Yeah, um, Amy B, Amy Brandon, cool. who we said to earlier. Uh, Jeff McFadden, who I just mentioned, who's based here in Hamilton. Um, Craig Visser in Ottawa, Christine Duncan, Mo Tweezerar, who is Canadian but based in Finland now. Dale Kavanaugh, who's over in Germany. And then, who am I missing? Two people that I can't think of. Oh, um, Christina Volpini. Oh, cool. Also in Hamilton. Nice. And there should be one more person, Tim Phelan in Niagara. Tim Phelan. Cool. Yeah, Christina's, uh, well, I mean, we're, we're supposed to work on a piece with her, me and Nathan and her, but now we're not sure about this trip in the fall that we were going to use it for. So we'll see yeah, what happens. Yeah. Yeah. Because yeah. we were going to do a little really, European. Um, like it's a in, really interesting lineup of composers because they all sort of have various levels of involvement with the guitar. Yeah. Like wildly different compositional styles and. Yeah. Uh, little, yeah, I think it'll be really interesting. Um, Nathan actually you worked on the the sonata he wrote with Christine, so. He what? Nathan was taking lessons with Christine Duncan on writing the sonata he wrote for me. So. Oh, that's cool. Yeah. So she's seen a bunch yeah. of her guitar score. <laughs> yeah. I don't know if she's written for guitar no, before. She said, what is she? She wrote a piece for. At least she wrote a piece for two guitars and violin for um, Louis. Trio. Trio oh, Tanger. Okay, yeah. cool. And I think she's written another, like, one or two guitar tunes as well. I think, like, chamber music. I don't know if there's any solo uh, pieces. Okay, I didn't know that. That's cool. That explains why she was able to help Nathan so well, too. I mean, in general, she's great. Her music is great, but... Yeah. Yeah. But, cool. That's exciting. I'm excited to hear this. Yeah, I think it's a, it's a really interesting um, project for me. Um, mm -hmm. Especially because I kind of, like... It's a very like Hamilton project in a way and kind of a very personal project, right? Because I sort of grew up with all these stories about William Blair Bruce and then 
like the Hamilton Art Gallery was founded with like a donation of his works from his family and yeah. you know these sort of art works that I've sort of grown up surrounded by you know and it's interesting to see like what will happen turning that into like a musical project that's awesome yeah and music inspired by image is also like great people it, people can really connect with that you know yeah yeah which is great yeah yeah visual things help for sure and um probably I, I would imagine composers like working with the visual like you know component as well mm -hmm. um yeah i well, think so I, mean, I, I like all these composers i approached about the project seemed like quite interested in in working in that way so um, it's cool i think it'll yeah are you gonna have to do any amplified jars with christina mm -hmm. oh really uh, I don't know about amplified jars, but um, I think there will definitely be some, um, you know, funny business with tapes and things. Electroacoustic element, yeah. Yeah, yeah, cool. that's what I said. Oh, nice. Yes, that's exactly <laughs> what you said. Um, Tim, <laughs> Tim Beatty says, is that a Grolsch I see, Emma? Yeah, it is. You know what, Emma? Somehow we totally lined up without meaning to. Are you having a Grolsch? Yeah. Wow. Oh, really? Yeah. Is it actually, is it like decent beer over there? Because I just kind of assumed it's like the Budweiser of the Netherlands. I mean, it's not like amazing, but it's not bad. And also over here, this is the like just sort of baseline Grolsch, but they also have like more like craft type stuff Grolsch makes here. Like there's like seasonal beer that they make and stuff. But yeah. it's kind of like that stuff is kind of like the lower end of, you know, nicer beers, basically. Okay. If that makes sense. Well, it does the trick. Yes, for sure. Tim, if you have a girl, she better have it now. Yeah. Um, well, I uh, I looked through my beer selection and chose that on purpose in solidarity with your location. Yep. The Netherlands. We actually just had King's Day yesterday. Mm-hmm. Yeah. It was funny, though. My, like, Dutch students who I asked about it were like, I don't like King's Day because... Some people are kind of Republicans, you know, so they're like annoyed that they're still a king. <laughs> so, but yeah, I didn't wear any orange though. I don't actually have any orange clothing. I realized, which is too bad. You can get Jessica to crochet you something. Will you crochet me something orange? No. She says no. <laughs> yeah. So supportive of my of our new our new location. In <laughs> Anyhow, cool. So you've got the that that CD, and then you have another CD that you just recorded, right? Solo one. Yeah. Which is. Um, nineteenth century music that no one plays. Cool. Yeah. Some Emilia Giuliani, right? There is some Emilia Giuliani, um, and then there's some Pratton, Piston, Bunard, uh, what else? Goni. It's all sort of like uh, lost ladies of the 19th century. Cool. Yeah. I actually started reading through some of those Emilia Giuliani preludes after seeing them at your place. The yeah. They're cool. I thought you were going to put them in the, um, the listening test. Oh, no, I didn't. I should have. That's a good idea. Oh, I missed out. I should, have, I should have replaced that c composition by that loser composer in the first <laughs> with some music by a much better human and better composer. Um, uh, yeah, cool. Well, I'm excited to hear that CD, like, really stoked. And it's on a 19th century guitar, right? Yeah, it's on um, a guitar that Mia Jackson Donor built. Nice. It in Ruski in Quebec. And I think uh, you saw one of those, like, Tim played one when he was on your show here. Yeah, yeah. And then um, I think if you put on one of my videos later, I'm playing it. Yes. We will see this, so everyone watch out for that. Century rap, I'm just playing because I like it. Yeah, I mean, it's cool to hear, like, older instruments with newer music also, you know. <laughs> there's, like I said, there's a weird affinity between older music and modern music. Okay, anyhow. Awesome. So you've got, like, a lot of projects on the go for recording, actually. That's cool. Nice. Yeah, it's been, like, quite a bit in the last, um, in the last few months. So nice. it's, like, between... September and January that I did like the last solo record and the duo one and that's like I found that's like quite a lot of recording time yeah 
Cool. It's just like, and quite a lot, just like a preparation, you know, and like learning new notes and it's like, it does a lot of work. Yeah, it's hard to learn a new program. I mean, I'm, I'm excited to be done school here right away in my master's because I don't like learning a new program every year anymore. I used to. No, it's way too hard. Yeah, I'm now I just kind of like, I want to learn like a few pieces every year that I want to learn and then just like build programs out of all the stuff I've played over the last eight years, you know? Yeah. Um, yeah. Well, I feel like that's the way to do it. Like once you are not in school, all of a sudden there seems to be like so much stuff you have to do also. So it becomes like quite hard to learn a new program every year. Yeah, well, and actually this degree I've been like supporting myself and school through working as a musician so i've been in this weird like in between place of being a professional but also being a student it's just it's weird you know yeah, yeah. it's a lot of work but it's 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 good i mean i'm not complaining but it's just uh it'll be nice yeah. to it'll be nice to choose programs based on projects rather than like having to have a whole new program just because you have to yeah yeah absolutely yeah cool uh when you did your master's what did you focus on playing and studying did you have like a research part you had to do back then or no no, it was just like loads and loads of playing. Okay. Yeah. Because we had like a research project here, but I guess Germany's different and probably. I know, I was in your research project. That's right, you were. My interview. And I'm going to put that online eventually. Uh, maybe I can use some of these uh, new recordings of these new pieces once they're ready for that. Oh, yeah, sure. Um, because of the topic. Um, yeah, and you studied with D just Dale there, right? You didn't study with Thomas or anyone else at the time. No, it was just Dale. Which cool. was like my, uh, it was like living the dream, you know, like I had met Dale the summer after my first year of my undergrad, I went to Israel to her festival and like I heard her teaching a master class and it was like, that just like sort of confirmed the direction I would like to go in, you know, and so it was like really my goal to the rest of my undergrad to like make it to Germany and study with her. Yeah, she's great. I remember the master class I did with her in your festival must have been like five years ago or something like a long time ago that was a big turning point for me too actually oh time. yeah she's just like she's such an incredible teacher and yeah. like you know there's like this, a handful i feel like in, for all of us in our like development of these kind of like life-changing master classes you know where you just like walk out of the class and like everything's different yeah, yeah. <laughs> and like, for sure i had a couple of those with dale yeah she's great um she just really whipped me into shape in like one hour. It was good. Yeah. And not even, and it wasn't even like, it wasn't something where I could immediately do everything she wanted, but it just like left, I left with so many ideas of how to improve what I was doing, you know, yeah. um, which is more valuable in a way. Cause then you can go away for a month and do all the work, you know, Yeah. or whatever. Yeah. Cool. Um, and you only lived, ever lived in Germany, right? In Europe. Yeah. Okay. But you're yeah, here. For quite a while though, like for almost five years. Okay. So I went, I was studying privately with Dale for a year, um, to like learn how to play guitar well enough to have study with her at school. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and then also like spent some time learning German. And then the school she was teaching at just like closed. And so then it was like the sort of semester of like limbo before she got her job in Detmold. So Wow, okay. Um, yeah, so I kind of like traveled around and did some entrance auditions at some other places, and then um, I was just totally delighted when Dale wound up having this having this new position. Yeah, that's great. Yeah, I mean, I had a I had a year when I first arrived here too of just like taking private lessons before doing the audition again mm -hmm. um, with Carlo in Maastricht. I mean, the in Europe, it's I mean, in North America, it can be the same way in some places, but the number of applicants is just crazy here in some places. Yeah. Like, I think when I applied in Maastricht, there were, like, 47 applicants or something. Well, I am... Um, I auditioned in Maastricht, too, like, a million years ago. But I think Carlo had only been there for, like, maybe a year or something. Like, it was a quite new program. Oh, okay. I, so I don't think there were that many applicants. Yeah, it's... But I, I don't know. I mean, I just showed up and played my stuff and went yeah. for a girl. Went for a Grolsch, nice. Maastricht is a cute. Maastricht is a cute city. It's very charming. Yeah. Um, it's really pretty, actually. But I kind of glad I live in a bigger city because it's a bit small for sure. Yeah. Although I guess small for like the Netherlands is not that small. But... Well, no, the cities here are not that big. Anyhow. Um, cool. So, do you, what are your favorite recipes, Emma? I mean, you've cooked a lot of amazing things when I've been at your place, but like, what are you cooking these days? Um, well, I haven't been cooking so much these days because I've been um, all alone for five weeks. Right. Um, 
like I have a housemate, so like a tenant who lives here, but he has this um, crazy job collecting the dead. So yeah. hi, Dean. <laughs> so he moved out for a while. Um, but yeah, so I would like was not doing so much in the kitchen, but I do. I love baking. Like I bake my own bread all the time. Nice. And when I am able to like actually see other people, I bake lots of other things. Cool. You know, bake pies, whatever. Yeah, we bake but our own bread too. Yeah. Oh, it's so rewarding. Yeah. Yeah. So I feel like I, have, I don't have a good answer for you. I'm drawing a blank. I feel like now that you asked me that question, I can't remember anything I've cooked in my life. Well, I can remember a few things, but yeah. I mean, like, it is kind of hard to motivate yourself, I guess, to make, like, a big meal when it's just you. I guess I'm lucky that, like, since Jessica and I live together, we have, like, an excuse to cook, like, interesting meals all the time. Yeah. Although, she's looking offended now. I think Jessica would cook amazing meals regardless. Yeah. <laughs> I have an excuse to cook nice meals. <laughs> yeah. Well, I mean, I've still been cooking a lot, but it hasn't been any, like... You know, since I haven't really needed to, like, impress anybody or anything. And, of course, like, the amount of shopping you can do is quite limited. So it's not like I'm just, you know, strolling through the farmer's market every day anymore like I used to. Right. Yeah, yeah, that's true. Yeah, that's, yeah, the shopping is difficult. Do you get stuff delivered there? Like, is there a lot of, like, groceries by delivery or no? Yeah, you can, but it's, like, quite a long wait. And I kind of feel like I should just leave the deliveries for, like, the elderly people that really need it. Yeah. So kind of like mask up and go out every couple of weeks and stock up yeah well but Tim i also have lots of things in my garden and even though it's still like quite early in the spring here um there's like enough sort of green things going around like that i can like the sorrel's up the chives are up there's other herbs that have come up yeah yeah we have um a little garden we built in our or built <clears throat> grew in our courtyard like in potted plants jessica grew she's all, like looking annoyed again um <laughs> uh i i mean well okay i picked some of them up from the like garden center that's was my contribution um and so we've been using some of those herbs and stuff which is really nice yeah um and tim says that's a very gender normative question michael i'm sorry it's only because i've been to your house and you've always made like incredible food so it's yeah okay i wasn't offended by the question good i'm glad i didn't offend you Emma. Until Tim mentioned it. Now, Unt <laughs> now you're pissed, yeah. <laughs> it just every time I have a female guitarist, then I'm going to ask that question, you know? Yeah. <laughs> what do you like to clean? Yeah, what, what, how are, what are you cleaning these days? <laughs> it's a joke, okay. <laughs> uh, <laughs> there was somebody else. Ellie just asked what I've been doing besides practicing. So I'm just going to answer that. Mm -hmm. Um and so I have been, well, I have been practicing a lot, but I've also been kind of working on some new stuff, so like doing some grant applications. I've been trying to have a bit of fun, like from a distance. So like Jesse, my friend and I just recorded like one of those like split screen videos. Cool. Um, which is so much harder to do than I thought it would be. Um, doing some writing. But then I also like, I'm hosting an online movie night every Thursday with, uh, you know, outfits and i have an online art club so i've been like busting out my pastels not that i have like any actual art skills but it's like a fun distraction at this time i saw your self-portrait it was very good oh, i thought that was actually like it, i feel like it looks just like me totally yeah the likeness was striking i have a blue guitar so like that part was also accurate excellent yeah you started an art party group thing which is cool yeah, the isolation arty party. Yes, that's been fun. Yeah. Fun to be creative outside of your medium. Like, I feel like not that many classical musicians do that, but it's actually quite beneficial. Well, I, sometime in the fall, I was, like, feeling like I really needed to do something, like, creative that just wasn't playing guitar. And I took a couple classes at, um, like, at the Art Gallery of Hamilton. Like, I did a class in making felt <laughs> and um, another one in screen printing. And then I feel like that was like, both of those were like so interesting for me just to like go and do some like hands-on creative thing where there's like no pressure to actually get it right or anything. Mm -hmm. And so I feel like it's a good, like, it's a good pastime, especially right now. Cause I feel like I am alternating between feeling like fully excellent and loving my isolation life. And then sometimes feeling like quite 
anxious and fucked up about it. Yeah, no, I know what you mean. I mean, there's things about it that are nice. I, I started playing some video games again, which I haven't done guilt-free in like a few years or like a year. Mm -hmm. Well, that's not entirely true, but still. There's certain things that you can kind of do now, but then there's other times when you're like, I just want to leave the house and see another human, you know? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah. Tim is asking, do you have any tips for those of us who are grant application noobs? Oh, well, I do, um, I do write a lot of grant applications, and I do have, like, a quite high success rate in getting them. <laughs> Um, but I think the most important thing is to have a project that you're convinced about so that you're able to like write convincingly about it. But then after that, it's kind of, um, like I feel like you need to have a little bit more common sense than most people have with this. Like you should really read the, the requirements, like really read what the granting body is looking for, which a lot of people don't, right? They just kind of like squish their project into like, the application form and hope it works out and it won't but if you really are looking like like at what are the questions like how is your project going to engage with the community or how is it going to further your artistic project or practice like whatever they're asking if you actually address those questions directly um that seems to be like quite successful um and i find like whether i get a grant or not i always call the granting body and ask for feedback on what my like on my application and that's something I've heard over and over again. It's like what the committee really liked is that I just actually like looked at the application and answered what they were asking. Nice. So that's like um, a good tip. Something that Steve mentioned um, when he was talking about this, Steve Cowan, is also quite important, I think, is that you need to demonstrate that the project is able to go on without the support. Yeah. Of you're asking for which in a way is kind of crazy because if you could just do the project why would you need the ontario arts council or the canada council or whoever to give you money right but at the same time i think if you've got like a plan to make it happen no matter what that kind of shows like how dedicated you are to the project yeah i have a feeling that has to do with maybe like grant bodies having some experiences of people like applying for money and not really having a concrete plan or something or i don't know Mm -hmm. um yeah it's it's kind of a catch-22 because i feel like the the times i've been successful i've had like already acceptance letters and stuff and things like so it's kind of hard because sometimes the deadline falls like where like i know the canada council changed some things so that there's less hard deadlines and more like um rolling ones you know which is kind of nice because yeah. you can apply like right before you leave for your tour which means that you have more material to show them that's like this place has a contract with me. This place has an invitation letter, blah, 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 you know? But yeah. for me, when I've been successful, it's usually been those kind of situations where I can show, like, very concrete stuff. Um, oh, my webcam is doing something weird again. Yeah, so I saw that like, Tim just wrote, like, um, like, assuming we actually have a viable project idea. But that's something, again, like, if you kind of look at what granting bodies are funding, like, you can go through usually and see, like, what they funded in the past. And, and like, again, like, if you look at what they're asking for, like, think about how your idea is going to be viable for those goals, right? Like, if the granting body is looking to uh, put art in remote places, for example, which is something that um, I do and have had a lot of funding success with, you know, then think about, like, you know, how your product, how your project can, can fit that goal. Yeah. Oh, there you are. You're back. I, I brought myself back because my camera's doing weird things anyways. So if it freezes again, I thought okay. it's better if you can see me. Yeah, it is for sure. Yeah. Now you feel less alone. <laughs> Crazy person. Like. <laughs> Talking to your computer. There's like a voice coming out of it. Yeah. It's okay. We're, we're all, we're all doing that now, Emma. Um. Yeah. I would just say like that advice about like um, about writing grants it kind of applies for other things too like for example if you're seeking to get some concerts out there in the world yep. like when you send a concert proposal to somebody like you should know who you're writing to you should know what kind of music they present already you should know if they've had a guitar in the past or if that's something new to them you should know why mm -hmm. on earth they would want to hire you like what do you actually have to offer them yeah, when uh, when Nathan and I did that tour, it was also like we had many different forms of the email that we sent, you know. 
No, it should be for sure like tailored to every different um, every different presenter. And then same with every grant application. Like you can't just cut and paste it from like Factor to OAC to Canada Council to whatever foundation. Like you have to actually read it and like specifically write your grants for each each organization. Yeah. And like obviously some content will kind of get recycled. Like it might be the same project that you're applying for funding for, but yeah, yeah. But uh, yeah, the more you can really, really like think about what like. Like, cause it's a, it's a relationship, right? Like whether it's a presenter or it's a, um, granting body, like it should be like a partnership between you and them. And yeah. so not like you should just walk out in the world and expect people to give you money in concerts. Like you have to be like <laughs> selling yourself to them as well. Like what's, what's, what are you really going to do for their audience? Yeah. And you have to think about their priorities. I mean, mm -hmm. you know, you have to consider like your program maybe you change some things of your on your program to prioritize their priorities with that's like certain types of composers certain types of repertoire um you know there's just a lot of things to consider um including what they actually want from a project you know yeah yeah while still of course like being true to what your vision for the project is because they want to see that as well yeah for sure. Well, I think that's enough about trying to get money from the government. Um, <laughs> just kidding. Well, I, just, I feel like I've had um, like so many really great projects I've, I've had funding for, and it's really made such an impact on my life. Like, yeah. For example, last year I was able to um, commission a piece from Amy Brandon, and then the two of us went to Spain and premiered it together in Malaga, which is like that was great, the whole process, you know, mm -hmm. from the beginning to the end. Um, I got funding to go live in Lubeck for two months to research this album I just recorded. Sara and I have had funding to tour through, like, rural Nova Scotia and to go through um, rural BC. You know, like, there's, like, all these things that I've managed to, like, get funding for have just been, like, they've, they've been amazing trips for amazing projects that have had, like, such a huge impact on my life. Yeah, for sure. Uh, Tim's asking any books, resources you find helpful on this topic. Yeah, um, what's that book? It is Beyond Talent. Okay. Do you know the author? I think it's, it's Angela Miles Beeching, I think. No idea. So, well, I'll just chat. Like, you have it uh, here. Huh? You have it here. Yeah, I do. So, here it is. Beyond Talent, Creating a Successful Career in Music by Angela Miles Beeching cool. is like amazing. <laughs> and it just covers so many things that you need to know, like from like super basic things, like how to get a promo photo, you know, yep. and like what you pay for that and how should you choose the photographer and what should it look like and what's the most successful kind of photo to have to like, how do you actually introduce yourself to somebody important that you run into in an elevator to how do you write a letter to a presenter? How do you like get a grant? Like it just covers so much stuff about being like a self, um, uh, employed. Yeah. <laughs> um, musician. And I, I found it was absolutely invaluable. It's really great. Yeah. And I think it's also important to like sort of try to learn those skills now before, like if you're a student, especially before you're, out in the real world because because my experience uh, yeah well and i don't I'm not trying to be I'm not trying to brag but basically i've had to make my living from music because i didn't want to work like in a warehouse forever which is the other kind of jobs i've done like when i showed up here in the netherlands i was working in a warehouse for the first eight months even though before that i had had several years just being a musician in canada like making my living from music but because i was yeah. in a new country with a new language and so i haven't had like sort of anyone supporting me like yeah any any kind of yeah anyways the point is it's a really l slow process like you know getting students especially when you get to a new place or you're setting up somewhere and even at other times in a place where you've been for a long time advertising networking all these things are very slow processes and so it's kind of like practicing you can't just like start like i, I don't know i feel like if someone graduates from their master's degree and starts at that point trying to do these things it's like it's going to take years before you know yeah, well, as somebody who did that, um, I would agree. <laughs> oh, <okay. laughs> Not trying to throw any shade, Emma. <laughs> yeah, thanks. 
<laughs> but but you but you did it amazingly. That's the thing. So you know. Well, a lot of it though was um, like there was so much sort of trial and error, you know, with like starting guitar Hamilton and just starting a performing career, to getting going with teaching. Yeah. And I, I I wish I had had like a bit more information before I started as well. Yeah. Because you know? it was also when I came back to Hamilton, it's not like like because I started guitar so late and then basically as soon as I started playing guitar I left and went and studied it somewhere else right so then yep. I wasn't coming back to Hamilton with like kind of a network of colleagues or anything so right kind of yeah starting, um from nothing yeah yeah well it, if we're starting from nothing anywhere we are I mean that's the thing you can be like especially as a guitarist like well any classical musician but you can win like some really important guitar competition but when you show up in a new city no one's going to know what that means except for like the other classical guitarist who's like your competition or your friend but still the point is like it doesn't matter actually to your like local network really except maybe on a resume if you're applying to like a music school or something but yeah. the point is just like it, it's still with or without that notoriety yeah but just um well before I forget, there's that Beyond Talent book. Then there's another one. I think the author's name is Kresse, like K R E S S E. Bernhard Kresse is about, I think it's just called like How to Be Your Own Manager. Mm. Um, and that's what it's about. Yeah, cool. <laughs> Which also, specifically geared towards classical musicians. And then, if anybody is like looking for tips about um, like starting something in the community and how to make that really effective, um, Matthew Hinsley's book. Um, oh yeah. Creativity to community, and it's excellent. Yeah. It really has great, great information about how to like just get something going in your community and. Um, and even if you're just sort of volunteering for somebody else's organization or whatever, like it's, it's a great sort of resource to read and it's super engaging. You can fly right through it. It's a, cool. If you read but with really, really solid information. I should really read that with being on the verge of graduating and staying where I am. Yeah. 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 It's really, it's a, it's got so much good information. Yeah. The thing is like most musicians are actually well set up to do this kind of thing because they're already generally good at being their own manager with practicing. And with like yeah. developing their skills on the instrument, it's just that you have to apply that to like administration <laughs> and like yeah. billing and updating your website and like all those other things, you know, I think something Steve said to me back when I was like still very new to like sending proposals, trying to get gigs like that kind of thing. Um, I feel like it was around that time that I asked Steve, like, how do you do it? You just have to send so many emails. He's like, well, you just have to have like your hour of power or whatever a day where like that's what you do. It's like administration, you know, at least for an hour a day. I'm like, oh yeah, it's just like practicing. <laughs> yeah, but it's kind of nice because a lot of the administration stuff you can do later in the day also with a glass of wine. Exactly. This is what I found as well. <laughs> you can have... That's not a successful practice technique. Yeah, I can't have beer in practice, but I can have a beer and send emails for sure. Yeah. Um, or, or... Be careful of that though. Yeah, it's true. Don't have too, <laughs> don't have too many or you're going to be a little too... <laughs> A lot of times where I like, just put all of these in the drafts folder until tomorrow. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, exactly. yeah. It was like a little bit too enthusiastic with your proposals, you know? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> oh man. Yeah. Yes. Well, yeah. And that's the thing too, is like, you should save it, I guess for sure for when you're a little bit more like you don't, you use your good energy to play the guitar, hopefully most days. Yeah, exactly. Um, Although some things like, I don't know, some things like when I have to edit videos or something, sometimes I like to do that in the morning when I'm like fresh. I don't know. It depends. Yeah. Well, you just find whatever works for you, right? Like whatever mindset is going to work for all these different jobs. Yeah. And every person's different. Some people practice better at 12 at night rather than 10 a.m. You know? Yeah. So it just depends. Um, cool. Well, uh, shall we play a game of, oh, no. We are going to... Yes, we are going to play a game of Would You Rather. Okay, I'm ready. You ready? You know what Would You Rather is, obviously. Yeah. Yes. I've, I've been watching your show. Yeah. Oh, that's right. I don't even need to explain anything to you, Emma. This is I'm amazing. I'm your biggest fan. You're my biggest fan. I feel so special. Um, okay. I've been so excited about this for weeks. I've been so excited. You've been like the, the guest I've been looking forward to the most, I would say. Yeah, suck it, Tim. <laughs> no offense. <laughs> That was after Tim. Okay, anyways. I don't, I don't, if I have to choose between you two, it's not, it's not fair, you know? 
It's not a competition, Tim. I still love you. Okay. Um, <laughs> would you rather uh, play with a chamber partner who cannot lead or follow rhythmically or a chamber partner who is completely dead in terms of dynamics and articulations? Oh, God. What? <laughs> okay. Uh, play with a chamber partner who can't lead or play with a chamber partner who's totally dead with dynamics and rhythm. Can't lead or follow. Yes. Can't lead or follow. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Like, just really bad with, like, staying with you, basically. This is, like, <laughs> ridiculous question. That's the point. <laughs> <laughs> I know, it's so hard, though. Oh, Tim is giving the broken heart emoji. I'm sorry, Tim. Yeah, because at least you'll be together. Yeah, and then I could try and like... Sorry, I'm just getting like a plug for my phone. I could try and have dynamics for two. <laughs> As a guitarist. So we see the guitar, right? <laughs> Good plan, Emma. <laughs> you, you gave me very limited options. That's the point of Would You Rather. Um, okay. What's next? <laughs> um, would you rather only be allowed to play music before or after 1950 from mu music from before or after 1950 or, uh, oh fuck that's another really tough one i know that's the uh, point <laughs> yeah um i'm gonna think of a lot of really difficult questions to ask you next time we talk and see how you like it you can uh, guess you can have me on the show, okay? You can you can interview me. <laughs> okay. Um, after after. After okay, yeah. I think I would say the same too because I just couldn't give up working with composers. Mm -hmm. uh, would you rather teach a student whose technique you have to like completely overhaul and just like really struggles with technique, or one that's really really hard to inspire musically and just like can't be like creative really with the music? Oh, the first thing for sure. Overhaul okay. the technique. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, because that's, like, doable, I guess. It's hard to tell someone how to be musical. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, it's extremely challenging. Yeah. Uh, would you rather play a concert with no sleep the night before? Or uh, eat an uncontrollably hot chili pepper right before you go on stage? <laughs> um, I think... Like, either one. Like, I like chili peppers, and I play... <laughs> Lots of times with like hardly any sleep, so that's like. I mean, it was like a chili pepper where like I couldn't like you know. Like you're crying, like. like... No sleep. No sleep. No sleep. Okay. Okay. No sleep. Okay. Uh, would you rather go to a festival and be a judge in the competition, or would you rather direct the guitar orchestra? Oh, um, that's also tough because I like doing both of those things a lot. But I've, I've directed the guitar orchestras for a couple of festivals, like, in the last couple of years, and I had so much fun with it. Cool. I, I will choose that from now, for now. Uh, but also, did... I've done so many competitions that, like, but, like, the orchestra directing is a little bit fresher for me. Right. So. More, like, you haven't done it as much. You did that at Guitar yeah. Fest West, right? Yeah, it was the best. What a great orchestra. Oh, shout out so to anyone in Calgary or Edmonton or Alberta. Um, I... Or I guess people from BC also go. I, I really need to go back there to go to that festival one time because it was the first festival I ever went to. It was the first time I had been to that festival, um, like last summer. And it it's excellent. Like, yeah. um, it's such an amazing job of organizing everything. And it has a great atmosphere. And the orchestra was, I think there were about like 30 people in it. So it's like a great group. Yeah. And just, I find like the um, guitar culture in Calgary is just kind of amazing. Like, the mm -hmm. students are all super prepared, super enthusiastic. All the teachers are so good, you know, like yeah. um, all these community guitar players are like meeting with each other all the time, having little like duos and quartets and stuff. Like there's so much going on. Yeah, that's where I uh, felt, started to play guitar actually, first learned. I know, where I met you. Yeah. Yeah, that's right, in that little cafe with Mustafa. Yeah. Um, yeah, yeah, Calgary's great. It's a kind of a gem for guitar, I would say. Uh, no, and I think that has to just be because, like, all the teachers there are so excellent, you know? Because all this sort of culture of every place kind of filters down from the top. And no, like, for sure. There. 
there, like um, Ralph and Brad and Murray, Brett, like that are just so awesome. Yeah, Cat, Cat is great too. Great um, communities and yeah. What did you say? Cat is great too. Oh, Cat's awesome. Yeah, um, I yeah I love. Yeah, I love that whole crew and yeah they're all like very supportive and I like the festival too because they they cultivate kind of a very relaxed atmosphere but there's you know it's lots happening still it doesn't feel rushed like some guitar festivals feel very packed which isn't necessarily bad either but this one's quite like uh yeah like you have space between yeah. things oh and so I mean since we're on the topic um that festival is canceled this year but they're going to do a competition online oh cool so- whoever is into doing those things keep your eyes peeled and check out um i should i should maybe enter yeah cool um would you rather only be allowed to perform solo or chamber music for one year uh chamber music oh that was easy i'm just stealing steve Callan's answer (laughs) fair enough (laughs) I don't know. It seemed cool when he said it. <laughs> <laughs> nice. Well, everything Steve does is cool, so we all try to emulate him. Yeah. Um, well, he's different. Everyone from Newfoundland is cool. Would you rather teach a technique workshop every day at a festival or give a lecture on some topic not related to playing guitar? Um, I think I would go maybe for the second one because I have had to do the first thing at so many festivals. Oh, really? It's yeah. Like, how like the world is out to get me and they're like i know who should do the nine o'clock warm-up every day emma (laughs) (laughs) yeah i did that at the caron de las condes festival in spain this last summer with renee yeah and renee is awesome but having renee at like 8 30 in the morning with technique or nine in the morning is like intense yeah yeah you kind of just like get to your breakfast afterwards and you feel like your hand is gonna like fall off you know yeah I mean, that's kind of like the usual festival feeling anyways, I think, but... Yeah, well, every... Enhanced by having to teach a technique class first thing in the morning. Yeah, of course. Um, Would you rather play a concert somewhere with a really obnoxious organizer who you have to deal with for, like, months and events and, like, asks for way too much information and stuff, or in a very fun and appreciative audience, or the reverse? Like, the organizer's awesome, you have the greatest time with them, but the audience is just, like, non-responsive. Oh, well, the point is to, like, have a have a moment with the audience, right? So that has to be the answer. Right, okay, that's fair. Like, the point of doing the concert is to, like, create a special experience with your audience. So even though annoying presenters are extremely annoying, like, there's lots of other, like, cool people I could just go hang out with. Right, that's true. <laughs> yeah, yeah, true. I should just, like, yeah, I would choose the, the good audience. Yeah, I guess it's not very rewarding if you do the concert and then it's just like kind of there's no response. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, Sorry? It's the worst. Yeah, for sure. Uh, Would you rather learn and memorize in one week for a performance? Which of these two pieces? Uh, So basically you have like Saturday to Saturday to like learn and memorize this piece and you've never played it before. We're going to assume that you don't know it if if you have played it before. Um, So you have to choose either Tres Piezas Españolas, the Rodrigo, or the Ginestera Sonata? Tres piezas. Really? Okay. It seems harder. I don't know. It's like a completely fictional question because I couldn't fucking learn Lagrima in one week. So, like, <laughs> I fair. just would rather play Tres piezas, so, like, I'm choosing that. That's fair. <laughs> it's more it's more up your alley. Yeah. I just feel like that Pasacalia in one week would just be brutal. And, and the Zapatero, I don't know. Yeah. Because the Ginestera, at least if you, like, fuck it up and kind of miss a section, you can kind of sort of pretend. Not if it's guitarist watching, I guess, but still. I mean, hopefully you're not playing for guitarists. That's, like, the dream, you know? I mean, that's what I hope every day. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> <laughs> Please let me not have to play for guitarists. Um, okay. Yeah, it's so funny, actually, because I do, I play so much for, like, non-guitar audiences that whenever I do wind up, like, at a guitar festival, it's always a little, like... Uh, that whole like level of intensity you know it's kind of super fresh every time now because it's like yeah you kind of forget how how nuts that is to have like an audience of all guitarists yeah I sometimes forget but I'm I mean, right now I'm in the middle of a master's and like one of the biggest programs in the Netherlands so I'm like kind of used to playing for other guitarists at school but I don't know yeah yeah um 
Tim just wrote that the Zapatero is terrifying to perform and I shouldn't do it. And like, there's absolutely no danger of that happening ever. You just play it really slow, like, stick with Merlin. Yeah, that's the one. Yeah. 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 Um, cool. Well, we're going to play another recording of yours now. Or not another, but the first recording since you've been playing live till now. Okay. So this is a Canadian tune. Cool. Which tune is it? There's two it's, Canadian tunes. <laughs> I know. You have to guess. It's uh, it's the Joni Mitchell. <laughs> another perfect for a test. <laughs> I'm going to play for you and be like, what's this piece? Um, it's the Joni Mitchell. Cool. So it's Joni Mitchell arranged by Floyd Turner. Who's Floyd Turner? Three- Boy Turner is a composer and excellent arranger based in Niagara. Oh, cool. Uh, and he uh, he did, yeah, all these arrangements of, like, Joni Mitchell, Gordon Lightfoot, and Stan Rogers from a Canadiana record. And, um, yeah, and, it, and I'm playing a Mio Drags guitar. Nice. Mio Drags a donor. Yeah, and it's a, it's a 19th century... There's no extra... Yeah. Stauffer copy. Okay, is there? Is there? I was gonna say Stauffer, and then I thought I'm gonna look dumb because I don't know anything about 19th century guitars, but I should have done it because I was right. I just told you everything I know about it. Like, yeah. about 19th century guitars. Does it have like an extra one of those extra bass strings? No. No, no, no. That's like that's too much for me. I can't handle it. Yeah. Every time I try to play one of those guitars, I just get like vertigo. Yeah, you're I'm like. Sorry. That I'm like, no, six is good. Six is already like quite a handful. I think. Yeah, six is enough. Daniel's playing that seven string with like the, that like Bach transcription. I'm like, did you really want to make Bach like more complicated? You know. <laughs> some people do. They're so into it. I guess so. Yeah. Okay, so let's listen to some Joni Mitchell. Okay. <laughs>
Nice. Awesome. Good job. Oh, my video is doing something weird again. One second. Looks fine from here. Uh, yes, but on OBS it doesn't. There we go. I'm back. I don't know. This webcam sucks and I ordered a new webcam, but of course everyone ordered a new webcam, so it's out of stock, so it's not coming for like forever. Yeah. Don't try and order like recording equipment online right now, everybody. Don't do it. Um, so what was the location that was in? That was Gage Park in Hamilton, oh. where uh, like the Festival of Friends take place every year, which is like a big outdoor bunch of concerts. Cool. And since they never invite me to play there, I just went and played a concert on my own in the band shell. Nice. <laughs> awesome. Um, oh, Tim says I gotta bounce now. Thanks for the good times. Thanks, Tim. Thanks for chatting. Um, cool. That was great. Yeah. Um, gotta love me some Joni Mitchell. Oh yeah, she's pretty cool. Yeah. Awesome. So, what's the future of the guitar, Emma? Um. It's hard to say. Like, I think the future of the guitar, in a way, is just, like, beyond the guitar. <laughs> like, I feel like it's the best way for its continued, like, growth and development and survival is to try and push out from this, like, kind of insular guitar world, in a way, right? Where we are just, like, all traveling around concerts for each other. Yep. Um, the more you can get the guitar out of that zone and into the wider world, the more opportunities for you personally, for the instrument in general, for the repertoire we're going to play. Um, and on that note, I would also say, like, it's, we should play all the repertoire there is. <laughs> you know, like, people yes. are just, like, playing the same stuff, like, um, I mean, obviously, like, we have beautiful standard repertoire that we love playing, but there's so much guitar music that is of such high quality that is out there from all the periods you know, that we're not playing, and like, yep. why not, when it's there, we should do it. For sure, I mean, I think the guitar suffers a lot from, like, well, being insular, like you said, but then also players just picking their repertoire based on what they hear other players playing. Mm -hmm. um, and not even, like, picking what they hear, like, you know, other players playing that's uncommon, but just picking what they hear all the time, and yeah. Yeah. I mean, it's not helped by the fact that, like, it's kind of assumed that going through your degree, you have to do all these different standards, which there's some value in that, you know? No, there is. I mean, we have to, I mean, we have to know how to play the hits, right? But um, even, but even within that, I think there's ways to, um, you know, there's still scope to learn other repertoire. And then when you're out of school, like, you can just go for it, right? Like, yeah. And kind of no matter where you start, I think, like, for example, if you just start looking for, like, Dutch music, yeah. <laughs> you know, you would have like such an incredible wealth of repertoire to play. Yeah, for sure. You know, like I can think of like three outstanding composers that are underplayed, like from the Netherlands right away, right? Like Anessa, who I played before, Peter van der Stock has yeah. like, incredible solo guitar stuff. Kravanger. Beautiful works. Yeah, and that Kravanger guy from the 19th century, or, uh, what's it? Yeah. Yeah, there's yeah, a lot. But, you know, so, and there's just, and then you could choose kind of any other starting point, I think. I mean, I do this all the time, like, like look for one thing on the internet, and then, like, several hours later, I emerge. Yeah, 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 <laughs> exactly. Loads of new repertoire, but, like, you could, there's just so much out there that I think is not played, mm -hmm. so. And I'm, like, I don't know, I'm, I'm always just attracted to that as a listener and as a presenter, like, looking for an innovative, um, program that's going to be something different from the norm yeah or work with composers and make some new music oh yeah sure yeah um or play the pieces that your friends have commissioned i mean like a lot of commissioned pieces don't necessarily take off but it's a shame because a lot of them are really good and a lot of those composers yeah. deserve to be heard so like you know ask people who you know who play new music like what have you like premiered that would be interesting to take a second look at you know yeah definitely um yeah Cool. Yeah, I think I, I think I agree with you. Like I, I wish the guitar would get a little bit out of its bubble. I say this every single episode. I say this on the podcast that's watched or straight live stream that's watched mostly by other guitarists <laughs> with a lot of guitar centric <laughs> questions and things. Um, 
but yeah, it is kind of the future, I think, to, to move beyond our, our borders. Um, yeah. Although that being said, like you were saying before, sometimes, I think you were saying this, yeah, sometimes the the local thing that started is reaching out into the community, right? So sometimes the the guitar festival, the guitar society is also serving that function to an extent of... Oh, definitely. Like, I know here in Hamilton, like, most of the guitar Hamilton audience are not guitar players because there aren't very many here. Yeah. <laughs> you know, it is a guitar society that is really connecting with you know, uh, I would say normal people, like guitarists, and then there's normal people. Yeah, non <laughs> non guitarists. Yeah. Non guitar audience, um, or lots of people that are playing guitar, but they're sort of uh, in a different branch. Yeah, and that's important too. You know, to to sort of like cross pollinate with other genres of guitar, other genres of classical music, other genres of music in general. Like, I think that's one of the valuable things about playing chamber music, too, is that you meet a whole new network of people. Like, I, there's a lot of guitarists who I think in school and stuff kind of feel like, I just really want to be a good, like, solo guitarist or I play in a guitar duo or whatever, and they kind of want to follow the model of success they see within the guitar world of kind of, like, the star players, what they do. Yeah. And they don't realize that, like, when you're doing that freelance musician thing, like you were saying, the networking is a huge part. And so then, if you don't play chamber music, you miss out on an entire network of other musicians, you know? That's for sure. And then also just like musically, as soon as you start playing with like other instrumentalists or playing with singers, like I feel like it's so helpful for your own musicality. You know, like you just learn so much. Um, yeah. Like, you know, like the whole approach to phrasing is so different. And, you know, you, I know I definitely, um, like I learned so much and continue to from working with Zara. Yeah, this is something that um, Lukasz Kudabachewski is great on. Is like, sorry, Lukasz, I think is how you say his name. Just talking about the value of learning from other musicians. And I think that's really true. Like, especially other instruments, you learn a lot just by rehearsing with them, you know? Um, yeah. There was this great festival I did in Calgary called Mountain View, which was, it's not a guitar festival. They have like, it's a chamber music festival. Mm -hmm. And I think when I did it, it was the first time guitar had been in like 20 or 30 years. But basically, the concept is they bring together singers and instrumentalists, emerging artists and like students who are sort of doing some professional work along with like, um, or students in general, along with like really established artists. And then they have you rehearse together with them and perform. So it's not like that you do master classes. It's like you work with these like people who are at a much higher level than yourself in order yeah. to learn. And that was a really nice model to see. And like, I realized we all know people even within our own like kind of level, let's say who have yeah. a lot of knowledge we don't, even if they're not necessarily at a further stage than us. So, mm. like, rehearsing with people and performing with people, you learn just as much as you do sometimes from having a teacher, if not more, you know? Oh, um, yeah, definitely. Yeah. Yeah, and that was a really eye-opening experience for me, too, because I got to play with, like, Jonathan Crow and Joseph Johnson from, like, the Toronto Symphony, you know, and it was like, I just learned so much. I mean, they're, they're real musicians, well... There are many real guitar real music, guitarists who are real musicians, but you know the level the level that they the level of chamber music playing was much higher than I'm used to in the guitar world. Let's put it that way, you know. Oh yeah, that's something for sure. Like if you want to learn really fast how much you suck, just like start playing with other instruments. Yeah, or and even just the way that you rehearse, like, yeah. it's different when you when you have a guitar duo, especially in school. I feel like you can spend a lot of time just kind of like playing through the piece multiple times and talking about little small things, but with like, other musicians work really fast a lot of the time, you know, in, mm -hmm. in rehearsals. Um, so, yeah. Anyways. Um, the, chamber music, the chamber music thing is very valuable. Um, yeah. In chamber music, do you feel like, I don't know, I guess this is more an issue with guitar duos than other ensembles, but do you feel like it should be... Do you and Sara, for example, do you try to present a very unified vision all the time musically, or do you try to play off each other a bit and have different personalities to some extent in the way you interpret things? Well, I think we just have very different personalities, like, um, in real life. <laughs> and so that sort of translates probably musically, but we've worked, um, but like, I feel like we, we work a lot on having like a unified vision for the piece. Okay. We, she's so amazing at like figuring out what kind of tone works with guitar and like we worked really hard to try and you know put together a really good ensemble so I feel like 
um, I hope anyways, it comes across as a unified vision, but I don't think it's like at the exclusion of our own like personalities as well. Right. Yeah. They're just, there can be, it's not, a, it's not a, it's not a dichotomy or attention necessarily, but like, for example, Julian Bream and John Williams playing together. Maybe some people don't like that duo, but they're a duo of two very different sounds, two very different players, and sometimes it really works together. Yeah. Other times, maybe not so much. And then there are people like um, Duo Melis or others, where you kind of feel like they're playing one guitar, you know, in a way. Um, yeah, I don't know. Yeah, well, I feel, like, I feel like Sarah and I, a lot of the time when we're playing, like, it's pretty, um, I'm trying to think of the right words. Like, we're kind of, like, we're breathing at the same time. We're, like, you know, we are really connecting with each other. Like, I feel like it's pretty unified. Yeah. But something that, like, sometimes, because I've just noticed, like, because she's playing the flute, like, the breathing is, like, super necessary. And, yeah. Uh, but so I, and I noticed just, like, over the years, I've started just, like, breathing always at the same time with her. And our phrasing just, like, really works that way. Mm-hmm. But there's sometimes, like, when she, like, busts out the alto flute where you need a lot of air, I notice, like, I'm just, like, playing my guitar, like, <gasps> <laughs> That's funny. Um, yeah. yeah. Yeah, I've noticed, I me and Jessica do a little bit of the breathing together sometimes. Um, although we, I, I the thing I find with us, because I have a duo with my uh, fiance, Jessica, who's a singer, and... I've noticed that sometimes it's nice It's nice playing with someone else because sometimes when your energy is low, they can kind of help pick you up again, you know? Mm-hmm. Not necessarily if you're, like, screwing up, but just, like, when your energy on stage is low, sometimes they provide that extra boost of energy that helps you get back into it, you know? Yeah. Um, it's, also just, um, it's also just fun, you know, playing with other people. It's, I know, because I was playing solo for so many years, really, almost exclusively until I started working with Tara, like... It's just like it's really fun to play concerts with somebody else, like to be on stage with somebody else. Like it's a totally different vibe, right? Like for sure. Nothing ever like is going to be the same like intensity and like great feeling of playing like a solo recital, but then like there's just nothing like playing music with other people as well. For sure, yeah. It's just a different experience. Yeah. Yeah. Not quite the same over video, I guess. Hey. Mm. No. Mm. Yeah. Well. What are you thinking about for the next while? Like, what are, I guess the CD recordings are the main concern right yeah, now. Yeah, so the CD and kind of getting the stuff done for that. Like, I have to write some liner notes and um, work with my friend Richard Talbot, who does all of my design stuff to get that prepared. Um, hopefully, I'm going to find out in June if I get funding to do this Blair Bruce project. Cool. Um, so... That will be really great. And then in the meantime, I'm just doing some like little things here and there. Like I'm putting together like an online community guitar recital for Guitar Hamilton. And cool. You know, just sort of find some uh, ways to like still offer some guitar programming for my community, even though we're not allowed to interact. Yeah, it's hard to do without interacting. I mean, that's why this stream exists because I was trying to find a way to do that. Yeah. Um, well, I've been having a lot of great, like, um, a lot of great online interaction with people. You know, I sort of do a couple of times a week, like, hang out like this with a few people and catch up with some people. But you kind of have to find a way to make it, like, like, it would be really easy right now to be on your computer all the time, right? Yeah. Like, I don't want to do, like, five video hangouts every day or like you're gonna go blind or something <laughs> when you're already having to like teach online and do so much other stuff like there's so many other things of like i could catch up on right now like write some more grant applications or whatever that are also all computer based so it's better to like i don't know find a way to do that in moderation like go sit in my garden and read a book instead. yeah jessica's been sitting in the courtyard a lot and making me go sit out there which is usually good for me yeah well it's like it's almost weather where you can just like comfortably sit outside in Canada. Oh, here it is. It's, it was like 20 degrees here like a couple of weeks ago. I mean, it gets cold sometimes, some days again, there's rain and stuff, but it's been like really sunny and nice. So yeah, well, good for you. <laughs> sorry, <laughs> I shouldn't talk cause we have like, we have, we have bikes and we can just bike outside the city in like 10 minutes and be on like this bike path in the country. So yeah. Oh, yeah. that's nice. Well, my neighborhood is, like, fully deserted, and as you know, I'm very close to, like, Lake Ontario, so I'm able to, like, go 
go out and not run into anybody and still be able to like Good. actually get out there, which is great. Yeah, that's important. Nice. Mm-hmm. Cool. Awesome. Well, this has been so much fun, Emma. Where's what's, the lightning round? Yeah, the lightning round will come. But first, what's your philosophy with teaching? Um, uh, I don't have one. Okay. I don't know. What's my philosophy with teaching? Yeah. Like, what do you like about teaching? Or why, what do you want to achieve with it? Or, like, what have you found works? Or anything. Just give me something. <laughs> come on, Emma. Anything. Anything. Uh, just give me something. <laughs> no, actually, I really love teaching. And I'm, um... I'm really lucky because I have some really incredible students. Um, so in Hamilton, I have a lot of like older students, so um, sort of adult hobby players that are super super committed, um, and they're, they're they're playing like really really well. So I find that's um, really rewarding, and a lot of them are so um, so essential to like sort of building this community guitar scene as well, right? Like they go to open mics, they go to concerts, they. Mm-hmm. So that's, uh, that's something I really enjoy. And then I teach at Mohawk College, which is it's like a community college. It's a three-year diploma program as opposed to like a four-year degree. Um, and I really enjoy it. It's like, it's a really fun program and I have a really amazing class there. And I mean, I just um, hope that they are, that they catch some of my enthusiasm. <laughs> yeah. But I feel they do. Like I feel like I have a really close relationship with all my students, and um, and so I think that translates into them wanting to, you know, work hard, and it makes me want to teach hard. Yeah. <laughs> so. Well, they're lucky to have you. That's good. Um, yeah, I I love working with. Um, I mean, I love work, working with all ages, but I love working with adult students who are really just passionate about guitar, like. You know, um, and I have quite a few of those here too. And not even just classical. I mean, I'm teaching some people who are doing like Hendrix and stuff. And it's just really nice working with people who really care about the music, you know? Yeah. Um, even if they don't have a ton of time to practice, it depends on the student. But a lot of students who really care about quality, it's really nice because I feel like I can apply my knowledge, you know? Whether it's yeah, like yeah. classical guitar or dire straits or whatever, like, you know? Yeah. Well, I feel like I'm also, I'm super fortunate because I'm. I'm in the position where, like, two years ago, my New Year's resolution was no more shitty guitar lessons. <laughs> Fair enough. Like, I'm not going to do any, like, teaching jobs I don't want to do. I'm not going to teach anybody that's not totally into it. But yeah. it's like, I quit some, quit some teaching gigs and, like, cleaned house a little bit at home. And so, really, I, I'm just, like, only taking the students that are really committed. Into it, yeah. But I don't, like, I mean not everybody has the option to do that yeah yeah and i well for me i i kind of i didn't make a resolution but it's kind of evolved a little bit into that in the sense that like and for me it's not even that like i need students who practice a ton or like are gonna take it super super seriously in every moment but it's more like that they care about the quality because like like basically i expect enough from my students i don't expect them to practice like six days a week for three hours but like I expect them to apply what I've said and to take it seriously and to show up on time and all these things. So like there's a certain level where you reach where it's kind of like if, if it's not working, I just don't try to pursue it and keep making it working, make it work. You know, I don't know. Like I get, I guess, yeah, it's, it's kind of like you, you put out your expectations and then hopefully that ensures that the students you keep are the ones who are really into it, you know? Mm -hmm. So Yeah. Yeah, well, that's what I would have said if I thought about it. <laughs> Fair enough. <laughs> that's my teaching philosophy. Yeah. <laughs> you put out your expectations and hope. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, for yeah. sure. Yeah, and I mean, and I, I, I mean, maybe I'm a little unorthodox as a classically trained guitarist in the sense that, like, I, I don't actually really impose much rep on people. Sometimes I suggest things that I know are good for their level or good for their development. But, like, mm-hmm. like I said, even if I'm teaching rock or metal or whatever... Um, but what I do expect is that everyone learns to read music. Everyone understands how music actually works. So like rhythm, harmony, melody, legato, all these things, they, they learn the terminology, even if they're playing like fear factory or Meshuga, you know, like they still learn the terminology. And then I expect them to like actually be musically literate enough to like achieve what that band is doing or that artist is doing or that piece demands, you know? So 
that's not the traditional like kind of rock or pop teacher method right but it's like i bring it to whatever music i'm doing with them so yeah yeah but of course i try to focus on you know classical stuff because that's what i do myself yeah yeah well i think like once you like slog away at it for like many years then you're able to sort of you can really refine your focus and yeah for sure yeah hopefully by the time i yeah we'll see but i mean i'm 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 happy with the teaching i have because i i demand that not demand but i expect that my students give enough to it that it's not like it's not it's not a drag for me you know it's never a drag for me yeah that's great yeah so i know what you mean about that that's valuable okay shall we do the lightning round i am so let's do this lightning round okay lightning round i'm glad you know the show so well this is really nice like i don't have to explain anything <laughs> Like Emma knows exactly what's happening. Okay. That's a sentence that does not often get said. Um, well, I feel like you always know what's going on. I always come to you for advice, so. I feel like the opposite, but I'm okay. glad I fooled one person. Yeah, it's all about giving the like illusion that you know what you're talking about, you know? That's the whole point. <laughs> okay, lightning round. East or west coast of Canada? East. Oh, I knew that's what you were going to say. Uh, cats or dogs? Cats. Nice. Good choice, Emma. Um, Bream or Segovia? Bream. Liszt or Chopin? Chopin. Free stroke or rest stroke? Free stroke. Breakfast or dinner? Dinner. Uh, team Edward or Team Jacob? I don't know what that means. Twilight? Okay, never mind. Um, South Park or The Simpsons? Oh, South Park. South Park is amazing. Uh, poutine or maple syrup? Poutine. Thibaut Garcia or Andrea De Vitis? Garcia. Villa Lobos or Rodrigo? Rodrigo. Okay. Vanilla or chocolate? Chocolate. Horowitz or Rubenstein? Rubenstein. Restoration of the composer's intention or personal interpretation? Both. Both. You can't say both. You have to choose. <laughs> um, composer's intention. I feel you have to start with that. Yeah. Um, solo or chamber? I guess chamber. Okay. If Sarah is watching, she'll be happy. Um, beer. <laughs> it's what is that, did you say? What Steve said. <laughs> No, that's why I said it. Oh, okay. Beer or wine? Uh, oh. That's one I can't answer, Mike. You know, I appreciate or I appreciate it. Yeah. All liquids. All liquid. All liquids. Wow. Okay. Uh, okay. Maybe not all liquids. But yeah. All the alcoholics. All the alcoholic <laughs> liquids. Yeah. Uh, concert or master class? Concert. Uh, contemporary or classical romantic repertoire? Contemporary. Campanella or regular scales? I can't play either. <laughs> nice. <laughs> Me too. <laughs> we have so much in common. <laughs> We're like the same person, Emma. <laughs> uh, sweet or salty? Salty, all the time. Okay. Tremolo or scales? Tremolo. And the most important one, Tim Beatty or Steve Cowan? Huh? The most important one. <laughs> Tim Cowan. Beatty or Steve Cowan? <laughs> Uh, I'm just gonna say Tim because I talk to him more. <laughs> oh, oh, burn, Steve. <laughs> what am I supposed to do? <laughs> That's fair, but Tim already left the chat, so he's not even here to like appreciate. Okay. Well, I'm gonna write to him right after this and tell him. Yeah, that you chose him over Steve. Yeah. Um, and I'm gonna even tell him I didn't mean it. <laughs> I didn't mean it. <laughs> uh, <laughs> Oh, that's an impossible question, too. Like, as you know, both of those guys are, like, totally awesome in every way. Yeah. And, it's true. You know. It's hard to yeah. choose between your friends, for sure. Yeah. Uh, okay, well, we're going to play one more Canadian piece of yours, a recording of the Beauvais. Okay. So what's the story with this piece? Um, this is a piece that was dedicated to me by William Beauvais, who's a Toronto-based composer. And it is a suite called Appalachian Colors, and uh, each movement is a different color. And this video is the second movement, which is called Red. 
Cool. Awesome. Okay, let's hear some Bove. Excellent. Yeah. Nice. Indeed. Cool. Super fun. Yeah. Very Beauvais. Very William. Yeah. Cool. Awesome. Well, thanks so much for being on it today, Emma. It's been great. Oh, well, thank you so much for having me. And thanks just for doing this in general. No I, worries. I think it's, really, it's super fun. And I, I think it's a great format. And it's really nice to just have this kind of like, I don't know. Every time I watch one of these, I feel like it's like hanging out with you and like, it's really fun. That's great. That's the point. I want it to be fun. And I, I appreciate the compliment. I, I admire you very much and all that you've done. So I'm glad that uh, I can feature you here and that we can talk. And wow. um, I'm glad you're enjoying the show and other people are too. So everyone, uh, you can find the archives on YouTube also if you want to watch the other guests. There's been a lot of fun people on and there's more fun people coming up. Who's uh, coming up? Oh, yeah. Who's coming up? Uh, Friday this week is Rosie Bennett. Uh, 
great guitarist from the UK. I think she is she Canadian also, or did you did she live? She, I know she studied with Renee. Oh, anyways, doesn't matter. Um, Rosie Bennett, and then I have on Sunday I'm gonna have Philippe Neves Coral on, who's a Portuguese guitarist. He couldn't join last week because of some uh, like throat sore throat thing. Anyways, you know, hard to talk with a sore throat for two hours. So uh, he's going to be out on Sunday, and then who do I have next week? Next week I have Evan Toucher and Pablo Villafuerte. So that'll be fun. Cool. Yeah. So. That's great. And I think you told me you have Amy Brandon coming up sometime in this. Yes. Right? Next month, there, or uh, following up, there's like Renee Izquierdo, Amy Brandon, a lot of fun people. Oh, that's great. So it's going to be cool. cool. You're doing an awesome job. This is really Thanks. cool. Thanks. Yeah, I'm trying to expand beyond just Canada. I mean, Canada is great, and I love all the Canadian guitarists I know, but, you know, yeah. Yeah. It's going to be good. And I think Amy might try, well, I don't know. We'll see. I know she wants to see if Julian can play her piece. Yeah. Um, I don't know if that will happen. We'll see. But I'm excited to have her on because it's something a little bit different, too. Like, we want, I want to expand a little bit beyond just classical guitar, you know? Yeah, oh, and she's, like, so cool. Yeah, I mean... <laughs> like, Amy's the best. Yeah, her music is awesome. And um, it's a little bit out, the norm, out of the norm of what people would think of for contemporary classical guitar, even. So it's going to be cool to see. Yeah. Um, awesome. Any any questions? Any last thoughts, Emma? Um, I don't think so. I think we've covered a lot. Covered I think everything. so, too. I think so, as well. We've covered everything. Everyone knows everything now. Yeah. <laughs> uh, thanks everyone for watching. Feel free to share the stream. Uh, check out the other episodes, etc. And tune in on Friday. Yeah, share it with everyone. Yes. Oh, there's Stephen. Hi, Stephen. Stephen Dunsom. Oh, William's watching now. I think when I tagged William, he saw it. William, your piece was just yeah. played. <laughs> okay. All right. Yeah. Thanks everybody. I'm gonna stop streaming here. Okay.